Hey up guys, it's Roy from Enlighten the Shadows. Today is episode five. It feels like we're just flying through these right now. I'm enjoying them so much and this summer has just changed my life and I'm so grateful that I took this step to change men's mental health and mindfulness um, and just give whatever I can bring on guests of all types of calibre. Last week was episode four with Chase Smith. Uh, talking about Black Lives Matter. It was an absolutely interesting, fascinating chat. I learned so much. He gave us a lot to think about. So I think it's very important in these times that we take on board. So if you didn't watch it, can you just uh, click on it? It's coming on the screen now where you can just subscribe to my channel, or even like, share, follow the videos, whatever you can possibly do. I really appreciate it because it's just about getting this information as far and wide as we can so that we can improve men's lives. But without further ado, I've got probably one of my big guns today. This guy has had some mad experiences in his life and we have just created a bromance from uh, last year with the yeah. B word, which we're not going to go too much into today. We don't want to lose any viewers or get too yeah. political, but Martin um, is a former MEP representing the West Midlands. Um, we won't switch party. <laughs> you probably guessed by now, you, you can look him up, but stay with us because this guy has got such a massive heart. He, he loves uh, to further people's lives. He's all about brothering and fathering, befriending people. And he's learned so much in his life and thought about what he can do with his experiences and give them. He's actually a journalist as his profession. Um, I personally think journalism is broken, but I think this man is one of the catalysts of moving forward in terms of media. And someone like Martin is a uh, perspective of scope we need today in this society. So. I want to say to you, Martin, how you doing, mate? Thank you so much for coming on. Doing very well. What, what a build-up. I mean, I'm sorry, the rest of this interview is going to be a big letdown compared to that, Rory. But yeah, it's great to be here, mate. Thanks for your kind words, as ever. Cheers. We were just talking as we got on the, the lockdown trims are coming out the Barneys. Um, mine looks like a bit of a shrubbery, but it always does. Just chipping yeah. off the you know, scissors. Tell us about yours, Mark. <laughs> Well, a few weeks ago, do you remember when Saddam Hussein came out of the bunker? And he had, he had the hair that was, that was up here and a beard that was out there. I was like that, uh, except, you know, without all of the genocide before it, thankfully. Uh, I had a bit of a trim. Um, I didn't want to cut my own hair. I've seen some disastrous DIY baldricks around my manor. So I've kind of just greased it back. And I just said to you, I look like Noel Edmonds. Nobody wants to look like Noel Edmonds. Perhaps not even Noel Edmonds himself. But look, this is what happens during the lockdown, Rory. We just got to muscle on and get through it, mate. But yeah, keeping me pecker up as ever. <laughs> oh, it's good to <laughs> it's good to start the show off with a laugh. Um, and it just I guess that exemplifies our relationship. We have good fun, we work hard, but we always have a laugh, don't we, mate? So yeah, um, we want to focus on, on men and mental health. Obviously, that's what I'm about at Enlighten the Shadows. Um, yeah. so there's a lot going on in the world right now. Demographics are changing. Society's just almost having a bit of evolution and revolution at the same time, and um, hopefully for the good. Uh, what I want to ask you, Martin, is, you know, I won't say your age, because you're looking great for your age, but <laughs> growing up in the late 70s and the 80s, can you just yeah. explain to our viewers um, your experiences and what it was for, like, you know, a working class lad growing up in Nottinghamshire? Yeah, I mean, I went to, I guess, what you would call uh, a pretty rough and tumble set of schools. I was born in Gedling in Nottingham. Dad was a coal miner. He was a coal miner for his entire career, 47 years. Uh, my dad was kind of dyslexic. I didn't realise this until much later on in life, but he hated school. Couldn't wait to get out of school. Married my mum when my mum was 17. Um, they had my sister, very young, uh, very working class traditional background. My dad worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day. If he could, he was underground, he was asleep and he was working shifts. So he was a, a sort of rare presence in my life that flittered in and out at great joy to myself. He was like the Superman coming home from the pit. My mum was a very traditional working class housewife. Um, I found out recently, actually, something really moving and that is my mum's mum was born in a workhouse. So I come from a background of very um, traditional working class values. I was born with no silver spoon in my mouth, but something changed when my mum and dad divorced when I was about 11. That was a big challenge for me. I'm like a lot of kids 
Um, my life had just been football and fun. And I was always not really into academia, got into a bit of trouble at school with fighting because like a lot of confused young lads, I couldn't really verbalize this huge confusion that I was going through. But I decided, I was told by my dad, one day I said to my dad, I want to go down the pit just like you. And this was, you have to remember, this was during the pit strikes of the 80s where we had a, if you think society is divided now, you know, history has a habit of repeating itself. The police were steaming into the coal miners on, on horseback in Nottinghamshire, where we were from. It was very much a front line of the flying tickets because, of course, those who know about coal mining history will know that the miners from Yorkshire and Derbyshire came down to Nottinghamshire because Nottinghamshire didn't really want to strike. And there was a huge social battle. And, and the scars of those still exist to this day. My dad worked through that strike, and so he was called a scab. And that meant that I became a target for, for bullying at school. And what do you do when you're that age? You just fight back, don't you? Because you can't, yeah. you can't articulate this, this huge confusion. But what I clinged on to, my mum retrained as a school teacher and she did a, a degree at Trent Poly, as it was then in Nottingham, became the first person in our family to go to university and said to me, I said one day to my dad, I want, want to go down the pit. And he was like, the pits are going to be over, sir. Mm. He said, he, in fact, he put it a bit more bluntly than that. It was in Calverton Coal Miners Welfare and he got me against the wall, left me off the ground. He gave me some proper man-to-man -man advice. I'm not saying it's good, but it was certainly effective. Um, get yourself educated, son. Do something with your life. Escape this, this community, which he foresaw there was no real future down the pit. And so I went to university in Manchester in 1990. I was the first boy in my family to ever make it to university. My forefathers were all miners or joiners, carpenters, you know, very kind of traditional blue collar mm. background. And then I went traveling around the world um, just as an escape because I had no idea what to do with my life. Um, and then I decided to get into journalism because I was writing postcards to my mum. My mum by this time had become um, a family liaison officer, a teacher. And she was working with some of the most troubled boys in all of Nottinghamshire. Her job was to keep boys out of Borstal, as they were then, Young Offenders Institutes, as they are now. Yeah. Um, the pupil referral unit types of kids from every sort of social malaise background you can possibly think of, Rory. Mm. Domestic abuse, sexual abuse, addiction, violence. And she connected with those boys because she listened to them. And she got hugely, hugely interested in trying to help those who'd largely been written off by the mainstream education system, at least. Uh, yeah. They were despised by the media. They had no real compassionate voice. My mother became that. And I started writing postcards from my travels in India and Thailand and all that. And I didn't find out until later that my mum used to read these postcards out to these boys. Now, these are boys who thought a sign of affection um, was taking some heroin to my mum because that's mm. what their man took. And so they felt that that was what you did, like a cat bringing a mouse through the cat flap. Did you, they did go you see that? Like, or no, was it something that your mum had to like, explain later on because it was too raw? Yeah, it was something that my mum explained later. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that, that I always remember with her was that, you know, school for them was, was a safe place. It was the only safe place that they knew in their lives. You know, they weren't having breakfast, they weren't being fed. And it started to open my mind, I think, about looking beneath the veneer, you know, rather than just, you know, putting all these people in pigeonholes as being wrong'uns that we should lock away and throw up the key, all that law and order stuff. So my mum read these postcards out, and it was my mum's idea. She said, you should become a writer, because you know, you're good at it. And so I did. I moved to London. I trained as a journalist. I qualified in 1995, and it was my life goal to become an editor. I worked in the Lads Mags period, and that was a really interesting time for masculinity and what men were up to, what it was all about for those who are too young to appreciate what it was. Lad culture was a celebration, I guess, of unreconstructed masculinity, booze, birds, drugs, <laughs> hedonism, oasis, blur. You know, it was one long adolescence, really. Um, and it was massively, massively popular because until that time, we'd very much been told that to be a new man was the only way forward by the media. And a lot of people didn't want that. A lot of people just wanted to escape, particularly mm. the working class lads. 
And so it became a massive, massive thing. I became the editor of loads of magazines, um, the original Lads Mag, uh, when I was 29. And it was a really interesting time where there was a huge backlash to this kind of conformity that we were supposed to um, be regulated by and you know, societal norms. And really, we were just two fingers to all of that. Mm. We were we were chastised as being brainless and sexist and misogynistic by the liberal media. But really, I think those who understand working class counter culture know really was it was essentially harmless. Um, and it wasn't, I don't believe, the lightning rod of all that became wrong and led on to this conversation about toxic yeah. masculinity, which I know is a huge buzz phrase now. Mm -hmm. So I find myself really on the front line of this quickly developing i guess gender war in the media mm. at least about men's place in the world and being a spokesperson for that generation i let's just say i i find myself at the center of a bit of a bit of a storm <laughs> so this it sounds like a transition from your childhood in my one so i grew up in the 90s and um I want to ask you this, these stereotypes, these um, boxes, these pigeon boxes that you talked about, about, you know, young lads, you know, being a bit thick, uh, troublemakers, um, and all this toxic masculinity, would you say those views weren't there when you were a young lad, but they, or they were there, but they've become more highlighted? What do you, what would you put this whole thing down to where we're seeing men um be stigmatized we're not in light the shadows we're not into victimizing men but we have to be honest about there's this stigmatizing going on where where would you say that happened in in british society particularly well, if you track back to the sort of 70s uh, the first wave of radical feminism um had many valid points look at my own upbringing it was very patriarchal it was very dad goes to work mum stays at home um, it wasn't about a woman having a place in the workspace, and it certainly wasn't ha about a man having a space in the home. It was black and white. And then we saw um, much more advancement towards getting women into the space of work. That's a great thing. That's what my mum did. My mum didn't want to be a housewife. She tried it for 12, 13, 14 years and thought, actually, I want to make more of my life than this. When we were old enough and we were at school, it was her time. Brilliant. But the one thing that my mum always says is that that generation, we didn't sit around and complain about being oppressed. We didn't complain about our preordained role of, of being at the bottom of the pile. Instead, um, through self-development, through education, you know, we could climb the ladder. And we climbed the ladder in a way um, that was always about betterment and it was always about being fair. It wasn't mm. about tramping on people on the way up. It was about being fair. But what then started to happen is, that, and we're seeing to this very day, was this huge inversion of the traditional patriarchal values to now of being one of, of, of male oppression. And so sometimes it can absolutely feel like if you're the very act of being a man, you're part of the problem. Mm. Whereas, in actual fact, the vast, vast majority of men are decent, loving. Like my dad went to work 16 hours a day, not to oppress my mother, no. but to support his family and, and to keep food on the table. And so there was absolutely a war on the traditional nuclear family and a woman's role within that. It was part of the feminist movement was seen as this was a form of imprisonment, enslavement, psychologically, mentally, physically. And... When that was thrown back at men in the mainstream media, I guess this would be about the mid 90s, when lab culture came, these two vehicles collided. Mm. And it was very much, if you conform to those traditional masculine norms, then you're a part of this system of oppression. And like most lads found this either confusing or ridiculous, but some of us fought back. And we fought back you know, through the media ourselves. And of course, that, in a sense, poured petrol on the flames and it became the Guardian versus Loaded, the Independent versus FHM. And we enjoyed those, those, that, yeah. that, kind of, that kind of sparring because everyone likes a bit of a dust-up, right? You know, yeah, yeah. A, 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 a mental dust-up. But it became 
a very accepted piece of science, this social scientific outlook of toxic masculinity and male oppression of women. And guess what? A lot of men said, well, that doesn't sound anything like me. You know, I, I, I love women. I respect women. I don't want to oppress women, but you're telling me that I'm a part of the system, therefore I am. And actually, it's the same, it's the same precise issue that we're seeing now in the Black Lives Matter movement. And it, what it was, was this birth of identity politics where everything was black and white. There was no nuance. That you're either for us or you're against us. And the vast majority of people are not like that. So mm -hmm. when I started to kick back against toxic masculinity, I was one of the very, very first voices doing so. So I left Loaded Magazine when I became a father. I became a father when I was 38. And I decided, uh, and it's the only time I've ever really fallen out of my dad. You've met my dad, didn't you? You know what he's like. Oh, you know, he, your he, dad's he's, a, he's straight down the line blow. Absolutely yeah. full of beans, uh, big heart, but says it how it is. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> great but guy. Very, very, very traditional. So yeah. I decided that, that because when I, at the time when I was editing Loaded, I wasn't getting home till eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. You know, I didn't see my son for the first six months of his life, really, mm. apart from the weekends. He was always asleep. Um, and I decided that I didn't really want to do that. I decided to, to jack in my job. You know, I resigned from a, a six-figure salary job. Um, my dad thought I was insane. He was like, what are you doing? You know, it's your job to provide. I said, yeah, but there are different ways, I think, of providing. Like, you were a great provider, Dad. You know, there's always food on the table. You know, we were always warm and comfortable and content. But also, you weren't around a lot. Mm. And a lot of the time, we were having to find our own way. And I just wanted to be emotionally more around. And at that time, I, I started then to, to, to get into the journalistic exploration of this new role for men and like where men's place was. And at this time, all of this debate was raging about toxic masculinity. Mm. And nobody was saying, well, actually, this work-life balance that women have been talking about for decades, men are starting to have the same dialogues themselves. But like maybe we don't want to work 70 hours a week. Maybe we don't want to be chained to a desk because we can't go down the mines anymore. They're all shut, but we can be chained to our desk and put our children in bed. Maybe it's time for a reappraisal. And I started to write about that. I started to explore the role of pornography in young men's life because as the editor yeah. of Loaded, which wasn't a porn mag, but it had you know, topless women in it. Oh, Some yeah. people would call that porn. I wouldn't call porn. porn to me. Yeah. yeah. Like page three type stuff. But a lot of people said that my magazine was a gateway to the harder porn and the, the media conversation at that time. This would be about 2010, 11, 12, okay. was, was very much the pornography was poisoning men. It was, it was giving them a sexual template of, um, of abuse, if you like, or certainly of power and control. And I said, Is that, can that be true? Because that just sounds, again, it's, like, it's not black and white. Mm, and so yeah. I started to write about my role in that. I was on ITV this morning, really mainstream TV shows, putting the case forward that actually, why aren't we just a little bit less judgmental towards young men? Why don't we give them a bit more credit? And why don't we actually talk to them and listen to them? Because wow, nobody massive. was. That's nobody massive. was doing that. It was just, it was an arm's length, once removed, judgmental position with no interface or dialogue with young men. And so I made a TV show for Channel 4 called Porn on the Brain. Uh, we mm. spoke to thousands of young men who, who were using a lot of porn. Um, we got really intimately into the lives of 24 of those young lads it really affecting their their lives in terms of their relationship status some of these guys have lost their jobs because they were caught using porn at work and yeah. um, some had great debt some had developed criminal records because they've been caught watching porn in public um, and we put them in a brain scan study at cambridge university the first study of its kind in the world and we created global headlines by saying actually these kids are looking at porn in a way that's in a sense addicting them mm -hmm. they themselves are being manipulated by the pornographers they're being thrown into this machine a lot of them find it a bit overwhelming yeah nobody had given these kids a voice 
And so what I started to do was just try and go into some of these areas and speak to young men and, and if you'd like, be their voice. Mm. At a time when very, very few people were, were doing this. And if you dared to do it, you, you were yourself painted as a toxic standard bearer for male privilege and female yeah. oppression and there was no nuance to debate but i think we made really really good headways certainly in the press because no one was stupid enough or, or brave enough or whatever you call it to, to be doing this kind of work there was a huge orthodoxy of thought that you have to go along with all this patriarchal toxic masculinity script and if you if you spoke out it was it, it was a dangerous thing to do because you were hugely attacked on social media, hugely attacked in the media. But I just felt, in a sense, if you if you do that that circle of completion, you know, my mum had listened to those kids all those years ago in, yeah. in schools as their teacher, and I decided rather than just banging out magazines and, and kind of um, expressing outwards, maybe it was my turn to listen. Mm. And that's, that's amazing because I feel like in times, particularly right now in the world, um, the art of listening is gone. And I said this with Chase, like I feel like people, it's an instantaneous generation. It's instant click, instant share, instant, I'll go with my feelings. And I really feel like the art of listening needs to be embraced a bit more. I feel like, I don't, I don't know whether we ever really had it as such or we're starting to find it through um, the fact that we've got social media and the mainstream media are slowly dying out or that their levels of um, viewers are, are lowering and we are the media, us, the people. And even in Light in the Shadows is, is a form of media. It's in our name mm -hmm. because we seek to do, I guess, what you did and are still doing, Martin. So I just, I just think, why can't we just relax a little bit, take a breath and embrace our differences? Like, when we were together on the general election, there was people who were way different to me politically, but mm. I was like, I want to, I want to engage this here, what they say. Mm. So I might learn something. And I don't think, I, I think that might be why I feel like people think that they're right. So they don't think that they have to learn from one another. I learned mm. loads of stuff on my last episode mm. and then watched yeah. uh, on Netflix last night, um, a, a show called 13 based on all the systemic stuff gone in America. And Oh, it, so yeah, I just, I just feel like we have to be really careful today. We don't dismiss people, don't dismiss a cause or don't dismiss someone's experiences. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I really hope and pray as, as society moves forward in these turbulent times that we can ha learn the art of, of, of listening more than shouting and all that stuff. So yeah. yeah um, I, I think that there's, there's lots and lots of um, points to pick apart there. Um, but let's talk about the media. You know, something I know a lot about. You know, I've been a journalist for 25 years. Um, I've worked for all of the big British newspapers. I was a regular on Sky News reading the paper review for seven years. Um, I've been across all of the daytime sofa, you know, all the radio networks, you name it, I've, I've kind of been everywhere. Um, and what started to change, and I, I will mention the B word at this point, because yeah, you, talk about, you talk about listening. Um, Brexit was absolutely binary you know it was yes or no in or out and wherever you stood on that um, people had their say and then we had a period of three and a half years where the, uh, the brexiteers felt that they hadn't been listened to and then when we started to look at the mainstream media take on that just as one is one standalone issue there was absolutely a feeling of huge disconnect between the people who are the media class and the average hard-working working class person certainly felt that their voices weren't on these platforms. Um, I was involved all of that time speaking out about masculinity, speaking out about men's issues, men's mental health, suicide reduction. I got very involved um, in men's mental health at a policy and governmental level um, in 2017. I co-founded an organization called the Men and Boys Coalition. And we were we realized that we had to use the media as effectively and compassionately in a way that made people empathize and listen. Because mm. we'd all been shouting for too long. Yeah. Um, and what we started doing, um, I told, using evidence, using data, 
of boys falling behind in education. Uh, that's been going on now for 20 straight years. In fact, there's just been a policy announcement today uh, that Boris Johnson's government, and that includes the local MPs in Nottinghamshire, the one who beat me, Lee Anderson, Conservative, um, are, they vowed to look at this. It's taken 20 years. And we got this script on the table by telling stories with, with human backstories. So we were speaking to the mothers of boys who felt that their children had been abandoned by, by the system of boys being expelled routinely, um, too easily. Um, and then a really worrying um, um, trend of, of the use of prescription drugs and ADHD, things you know all about, you know, from yeah. your background in education. And we said that there's an issue here, but we also put forward solutions. There are amazing solutions from Harlem, from the Bronx in America, where they've reached out to encourage more men to become involved in the teaching profession. And if you like, that's that, that, that idea of making it cool to care and making mm. men want to get into the caring yeah. professions, which are dominated by women, but there's no proactive. And here's where we get back on, on, on another problem. There have been no proactive um, recruitment drive to get men into the caring professions because men were advantaged. And it was impossible to fight for men and boys politically because this system of patriarchy and privilege had absolutely taken hold in the mindset, in the corridors of power. And it was very, very hard to punch against it. But we got in there, we had committee room meetings, we did stories of boys and with solutions. Great school went with Milton Keynes on an estate with every conceivable social malaise yeah. where they were making a real difference to children's lives by making the atmosphere calm and listening and giving them breakfast and treating them with humanity. These are kids who'd never seen a man read to them in their lives. Yeah. To this minute, I get choked when, when I hear that because like, my dad never read to me. He couldn't barely read. But I didn't think that that was... He was, I guess, too ashamed to, mm. to admit to that. Um, and when these lads, these teachers, these male teachers were reading to these boys, these boys' jaws were on the floor. They'd literally never seen a man read in their lives, and these kids were 12, 13 years of age. And as soon as that little thing happened, and also those teachers were really good at football, just like you. Like, like you're, you're a teacher who's good at football, you know, and... They, they were getting them through the football and then they were getting them to do maths or English or a bit of reading. And there's some really clever ideas out there that we were going to back into government and saying, there's a great school in Milton Keynes. You've got to get to it. There's a great, there's a great scheme in the Bronx. I've got the guy's details. Here's his, here's his email address. Here's his phone number. He's expecting a call. And they were like, ooh. And then Brexit happened and it all went to shit. <laughs> <laughs> because they had no, they had no, Blame on Brexit. Um, well, they had no bandwidth yeah. to do anything yeah. else. Yeah. I, I, I feel like as well, um, one of the biggest pandemics in, in the world and even in the Western world, um, personally, is fatherlessness. I, I, I really believe that if we can work as one, and that's men, women, children you know black white asian young old middle aged if we can government local level you know institutes you know school um networks all these things i really fear if we can do a lot of holistic approaches working as one without any agendas but mm. to see to see it i i i personally feel like does it, does, it, does anyone else see it that we are, well, my generation, even more than yours, is a fatherless generation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, uh, again, this, this, is, this is one of the central things that, that I was working on at Men and Boys Coalition for, for a great period of time. Um, the, the evidence you know, is, is absolutely crystal clear. If you, if you cross-correlate fatherlessness with um, educational attainment, um, in boys and girls, but especially in boys, because there's a very much a feeling, there's a brilliant book on this by a guy called Warren Farrell, it's called The Boy Crisis. Um, he's been talking about this in the States since the 60s. He's a kind of male feminist gone rogue. 
He's a brilliant author. You know, that, that's a great source. Have a look at that book. It's got every single piece of data and information you will ever need on this. Um, look at homelessness. Look at the jail population. Like 90% of our jail population, the men, come from broken families. Fatherlessness is an omnipresent um, factor in so many things. Um, it is in addiction, in violence, in, in so many things. And I would concur, if you're able to be open-minded and rational, that's direct evidence for a lack of positive masculinity on these boys' lives. So it's not the very act. Like how, can you, how would you feel if you're a lad who's been abandoned by their dad or their dad's out of their life for whatever reason, parental alienation, the mother doesn't want the dad to be a part of the boys' lives, and the boy is always being told that men are bad. And then you start to go off the rails a bit at school, a bit mm. like I did before I turned myself around. You might dabble with some petty crime. You might dabble with a bit of spliff. You might start having a bit of cider. You know, we all know where these things can go. Yeah. So how do you feel at that point if someone said to you, well, that's because you're toxic. It's your fault. Mm. You're doing this because you're a toxic man. You'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm just hurting. I'm hurting inside. And one of the things that Warren Farrell says that's so powerful to me, he said, you know, boys who are hurting hurt others or hurt themselves. Mm. And, you know, when you, when you think about that and when you look into, I started going to jails to, to give seminars on, on, on masculinity. Um, I went into a jail called Whitemore near Cambridge. And, you know, when you, these are serial killers for me. I mean, these are proper, proper class A, and there's there's a wing there um, where they have a director of psychology, and they've decided to try and take an approach of therapy and listening. Now, a lot of people like the Daily Mail, or whatever, they're like, "This is ridiculous." So they've got PlayStations, they've got Cadbury's cream eggs, <laughs> and, and you, you know what I mean, and all that, and, and you're treating them, you know, with compassion. It's like, well, so what's the alternative? What a Victorian approach of, of, of punishment. Yeah, I was going to say, they've been punished enough. They've been punished yeah. enough. They decided to try it. And, I, and I'll never forget, um, I was invited in there to, to give a talk on, on, on masculinity in the media. So I wanted to tell them, a lot of these guys have been in jail for 20 odd years plus. But I wanted to tell them what the media thought about men through my work. And I'll never forget, um, I told you the story before, um, it, it was in the chapel and all these guys started coming in. I got there early and there was a band playing that day and the drummer hadn't turned up. And I used to play drums years ago quite badly. So anyway, I, I, was, I was tapping away on, on the drums and this guy was tuning his guitar and it was obvious he wasn't one of the wardens. And um, he started telling me his story about how he would killed his wife. And I'm literally sat there and he's, he's a big lad. He's carrying a book. I'm not, I'm not small. No. So I'm tapping away on the drums and I'm like, and he started to tell me his life story and then very quickly went back to how he'd been abused as a child. And, and it was a really, really profound and, and provocative and confrontational conversation, which left me quite bewildered. You know, and then I went and sat down and I got talking to one of his therapists and they said, oh yeah, and they told me his story and absolutely horrendous story of, of how this kid had been treated when he was a child himself yeah and i asked them how many of the kids in here how many of the, of the inmates in here were were treated badly as a kid he had practically all of them in fact all of them and there was a guy in there who, who'd been a royal commando uh, he, he was a prison warden former you know you know green beret the hardest you know, them and the paras will fight all day long about who's the hardest but anyway the tough nut the toughest of the tough, who was now a prison warden. And he said to me, when I first came here, I thought the way of dealing with people like that was the way I dealt with my foes in, in, in the forces. I use force on them, I use a baton. And he said, and then you realize that doesn't work. He said, the longer you do this, the more you open your mind and the more you listen. I remember like being sat in this chapel with, with the stained glass window, just thinking, I had a real moment with, you know, somebody who's been in the armed forces for their whole life suddenly is turning into a touchy-feely sociologist 
purely because they've worked in this environment for long enough to understand that actually there might be some merit in this, then I kind of went away from there feeling perhaps we've got this whole conversation wrong about law and order and you know the stick and the carrot and, and particularly where the most damaged men sit. And I became great friends with a lot of those inmates. They were yeah. sending me postcards and, 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 and letters. And I really should go back, actually. Now, now I don't suppose they'll have gone anywhere. A lot of them, anyway. I should go back and say yeah. hello. But we'll go it's together. One example. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you could go. Yeah. Yeah, I still, I still know the, the, the lady who runs it. And I think it's just one example of when you start to listen more, you know, what, this, this guy stood up and um, he, he was also somebody who, who killed. And he read a poem. I've still got it on my drawer. He read a poem about toxic masculinity mm. and how it made him feel. And it was like a toxic, like a like a animal, like an insect, like something that you hate. That's what you think of me, just because I'm a man. I've made mistakes, but do I deserve a second chance? You might not think I do. And I remember, like this room was silent and there were tears in the eyes of, of, of these men who were some oh. of the some of the most serious criminals in Britain you know were being reached through poetry in a chapel at an event about masculinity and I thought you could probably put the, a hose pipe on these guys for five years and they would never have listened you know to a message in a way that they had in that moment mm. and there, there are many moments like that where they, they profoundly move you afterwards. And sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, isn't it, Rory? You know, to, to take on the burdens of others like that Massive. and to try and process them, especially because a lot of us who get into this, you know, we've got our own stories or our own reasons for getting into this. And a lot of the time, it's not because we would read about it in the paper and thought, oh, that sounds interesting. It's because you empathize with some of the people who are being demonized. And if you sometimes when you get inside their lives, uh, it's difficult. I remember quite often uh, feeling very overwhelmed you know, by by taking the burdens of others upon your own shoulders. But I like to think it was worth it because they would feel at least a little bit unburdened themselves afterwards. Yeah, I I sense that um, people. It, it's back to the listening thing. I I think maybe perhaps this is not to be judgmental. This is just me thinking out loud like perhaps people don't want to go that deep they are comfortable with their own life or struggling with their own life as it is and mm -hmm. to try to want to understand um behavior because let's be honest a lot of the stuff we're talking about um is suffering you know young boys suffer men suffer in different ways and then what that creates is a behavior you know, they feel the emotion from the experience, it creates a mood and then it enables a behavior. And a lot of the behavior is, is, is it's not seen as positive. So it's negative. Mm. So you go, oh, well, they should know better. Oh, mm. they, oh, they're kicking off. Oh, you know, and then you lose that, that vital substance, which I know is empathy. Mm. And it's not easy. Mm. It is not easy to be empathetic. But, mm. you know, I feel like society is trying to transition into an empathetic fighting for a cause. I feel like everyone's trying at the minute on Facebook. I don't know if you've checked, but oh, people mm -hmm. are getting a bit put off because it's becoming like this righteous movement um, in different mm -hmm. variations. And it's like people saying black lives matter and people are like, Oh, all lives matter. It's like, yeah, all lives do matter. But right now black lives matter. And then people go, um, Oh, but you know, there's mass child paedophilia. And I'm like, yes, I, I talk about it on Facebook regularly and people don't really want to know. And I'm not there to go, why aren't you commenting or sharing this? Um, you know, example of uh, Ellie um, in the Northwest right now, Justice for Ellie, she's massively uh, gang raped and groomed. And I've been talking about this for years since someone who society hates has been talking about it for a decade, um, mm. which I won't mention their name because it's a swear yeah. word. But again, it's back to that listening. Are we listening? Are we observing? Do we even care? And I just think maybe people are just like, it's too much for me. Um, yeah. I yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, it's very, very hard to listen because when you listen, you have to give an answer. And maybe we're not equipped to give the answers and we're afraid of our own deficiencies. I mean, if I sat down and said, I mean, how many blokes say to their friends, what, how are you doing today? Tell me how are you doing? 
And we all know we should do that. And a lot of blokes would go, oh, yeah, I'm fine, mate. Yeah, sound. <laughs> Seen the match. See, see Forrest last night. Yeah. And very quickly, you know, you know, they want to move on. One of the real victories, I guess, that we had in, in the, the men's, particularly in, in the suicide reduction area, which I got very heavily involved in. I, I wrote some big academic reports with University College London. And, and we, we started at this beginning point of rather than telling men they should be more like women and behave more like women and just, just talk, go on, talk more, lads. And that'll be as easy as that. It was, well, how about we change the way we listen? And how about we change where we listen and when we listen? And what we did, we did this big online survey that was completely anonymous. And that's a key point mm. because not everybody is as comfortable as you or I or people watching this show now about being expressive and open. A lot of people yeah. prefer to watch from a distance and they, they need permission. Yeah. Um, and that is why I think it's been really great to have people like you know, the Royal Family, Harry Kane. I did some work, I did some work with Harry Kane um, on, on masculinity and openness because when those alpha models, the Storms is and all these people start opening up, then the rest of, of men are, are given permission. But what we found when we asked men, what is it that brings you contentment? It was almost like the traditional masculine norms that society has been hitting on in the media for so many years, working hard, providing, being honest, being reliable, being dependent. They were the key core masculine values, being in love, being in a satisfying job. Now these are actually quite simple things on paper, but at the moment, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the lockdown, there's been a huge conversation about uh, how it's affected women in the workplace, in the media. There's been a huge conversation about domestic violence, you know, during the lockdown. There's been a huge conversation about the BAME community being twice as affected by COVID. But one of the things that came out really early on is that men were twice as likely to die of this, and we still don't know why. And the Women and Equalities Commission said there is some evidence that people of a certain gender are disproportionately affected they couldn't even bring themselves to say Same men word. and we're like do you know what you might think we've got a lot of privilege but there's a lot of hard times going on out there as well and back to that thing about listening is that sometimes people i think don't want to listen because they'll have a hard message coming out of it and when we listen to men they were saying i'm ready to talk about my mental health no, but I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go into my GP and say, hey, I'm feeling really shit about my life. And it's, I, I don't want to burden my friends because it's not like I'm being toxic and... and, and Flimsy. Yeah, it's not like I'm no. being traditionally masculine in a way that's damaging. It's, I don't want to burden my mates because they might yeah. not be having a good day. And so what we found was that when things were anonymous, or when things were done in group therapy. So we did some work with the Samaritans and having groups of lads in circles talking. The first half an hour was just banter. And the people in the room were like, yeah, they're not taking this seriously. But the psychologist, Martin Seeger, who led it, he's become a great friend of mine. He went, no, 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 this is the way men talk. Let them take the piss out of each other for half an hour. And then we'll see, <laughs> they'll, they'll move on to something more serious. And that's what started to happen. They were, like, they, they were, you know, talking about sport. They're talking about shared interests. They were testing the room mm. and they were testing trust and gaining trust. And when they have that, then they go, yeah, and things aren't so great at home. Well, no, my, my work's terrible. And then somebody else would go, yeah, yeah, me too. And then you had a conversation. But you had to have that, that warm-up, that, you know, that, that warm-up banter act which a lot of the therapists who were watching were saying, this isn't working, they're, they're, they're not taking this seriously at all. But they ended up completely rewriting how Samaritans took phone calls from men on suicide helplines. And by listening to, by listening to men and, and interacting with them in a, in a more banterous way, they extended phone call time. And anyone knows if you extend phone call time on a suicide helpline, you're saving lives. So when we start to talk to men about this, they start to tell us the huge importance of social networks, team sports, 
came out really well. Like we've been told for decades, haven't we, that competitive sport is bad for us. It makes us feel like failures. It doesn't. When you actually ask men, they love going for a knockabout. They love playing a bit of rugby, basketball, hockey, whatever it is. Or even going to the pub afterwards, because that's an opportunity. It's like, you don't have to go and play football and go for a drink and spill your terrible story out. <laughs> But you know you've got in that you you know you've got a network of people you can trust if you wanted to use them. So when yeah. we started saying all of this, it, it completely confounded everything that the media had been saying for years. And so they tried to ignore it. Because actually, if you say these men are hurting and they just want a chance to listen, and then we did some work with an um, an app, an AI app, and we got you know, in all the years I've been doing this, we, we got some of the most honest, most raw, um, oftentimes most beautiful conversations as well from men who are completely and utterly anonymous. We found out these conversations were happening late at night. Oftentimes their wife was in bed or they were alone. Maybe they'd had a bit of a drink, but they were being raw, they were being open. And our recommendation was that we should be getting these apps built, getting them out to men and like using them, integrating them into the NHS. And I still hope that we will do that. But the, the whole point was that we listened in a different way that was more agreeable to the way that they wanted to talk rather than trying to make them talk in a different way in a place that they weren't comfortable. Massive difference. Yeah, that's the person-centered approach that mm. health and social care industry has been preaching for 10 years at least now. And you think, are, they, are you really, when it comes to the crunch, when it's not going the way you want it and it's got to require you some humility and empathy and you've really got to sit there and, uh, and build the relationship up. Or are you really practicing what you're preaching? Like um, episode uh, three was Scott Harlow, one of my teammates at, at Stapleford Town, Stabo as we call it. Um, my gosh, uh, it's had the most views out of my episodes so far. Um, it's been popping off with shares. Uh, we've got our own WhatsApp group, uh, the team. And, uh, you know, it did something. Um, we've built like a, a brotherhood. Um, and, and some of those lads have known each other for decades. Um, and some of them, like me, I've only m known one or two of them for about eight years. But the point I'm making is from this very thing that we're talking about, it's like we're not saying on the WhatsApp group or um, from now on, lads, we've got to like, slit our, our wrists and open yeah. up all the wounds and um oh yeah. let's have a pity party all the time but it's created that sense of, of trust in that environment where we can mm. listen and we mm. feel brave and open enough now to say i've got yeah. some it and we then go to direct in uh, messaging not on the group per se um and there's a, there's one or two that are still like oh you know they've muted mm -hmm the group because it got a bit too mushy for them and that's totally understandable their life must be yeah, yeah. that sound and that's great but we've now opened up a bit now where it's not just the banter and the football and those things are 100 percent necessary mm. as we've just said yeah. but there's that little you know avenue now where people can go and it opened up scott and i recommend i'll put it on the screen right now mm. scott harlow um, mental health impact COVID-19 and, and Martin I, mm. I really um, mm. hope and pray you watch it and, and share it on your Twitter yeah. because yeah. this guy's life has been completely changed um, through many different you know factors but it's really really inspirational uh, it's really touched me I'm like flipping mm. out this the guy teared up he started nearly mm. crying um, mm. well he was but not you know buckets yeah. because he was laying it he felt comfortable. Like, yes, yeah. he knows it's going to be a viral platform on YouTube, but, and this is not about me, but me and him have, I've got that relationship where we have a laugh. We both love leads, sadly. Yeah. Um, but he felt comfortable to just lay it out on my YouTube yeah. channel. And that's why we're doing this chat today, Mark. And I'm loving everything you're saying. I'm so enjoying it. And it's gone on a deep level. It's not, it's like an onion. We're peeling the layers. Yeah. You've got to go deep yeah. and, really know what the route is so yeah. yeah it's good yeah that's true and and you know what was really heartening about um the studies i did with um john barry dr john barry he's he's a co-founder of the male psychology network anyone who's interested in male psychology they are the real um lads to go and check out and ladies um they they don't subscribe to toxic masculinity theory 
uh, they're much more empathetic um, towards masculinity and, and men's requirements and the really the really heartening thing is that the the 18 to 24s we, we weren't allowed to ask under 18 for, for ethical reasons but the 18 to 24 24s are much much more open about these sort of conversations than, than the older generation you perhaps just would expect that to an extent but i think that should give us real cause for comfort that you know we are i think gradually Know, through through the media, through through the changing ways that we can be men. You know, as I said, a generation ago, it was a blue collar trade or a blue collar trade. Mm. I mean, nobody went to university from from you know streets like I came from, communities like I came from. Now it's much more commonplace. Although in terms of social mobility, we still have a big problem. I would like to see student loans means tested. Um, I would like to see um, financial incentives for working class people to go to university. White working class men are the least likely demographic in the UK to attend university. We still have lots of barriers. The biggest barrier is just debt. You know, the, the thought of going into a debt of £50,000 for, for a lad whose parents probably have never earned that is, 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 is prohibitive. So we have like a natural self-selection system now. When I went to university, um, I got a full ground and I got a, a national cold ball top up as well because my dad applied for it. So I, I, was, I was doing really well as a student. You know, I didn't have any cost. And I worked at the pork farms in, in, in my holidays, you know, packing pork pies. And I, I just got on with it. But now it's, it's, it's very different. And if we're talking about education as a way out, yeah. then there are substantial barriers to that now. So in a sense, we're kind of going a bit backwards. Got you. Um, this is one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about um, was because we've, we've gone to the roots and we've talked mental health and men and boys, it's been class. Um, I want, cause I want to be relevant in terms of what's going on right now. So we've seen over the last few weeks, a lot of rightly or wrongly male tribalistic um, mm -hmm. behaviors demonstrated in, in the streets and cities of, you know, not just this country, but, other and uh, you know, uh, and females, they're just as equal in our eyes. We love them, they're important. And females have been rising up too, but predominantly mm. it's male yeah. and it's tribalism. Like, I just want to ask you, like, what, what do you think they're trying to communicate? What, what do they want? You know what, a core topic of this episode has been listening. These people don't feel that anyone's listening to them. Now, whatever side of any of these debates you're on, um, the Black Lives Matter movement feel politically isolated, ignored, but mainly just not listened to. And I guess they would argue um, that the softer media approach just hasn't had the cut through that's been required. And also, if you look into the political motivations behind Black Lives Matter, which incidentally is a very different thing, I believe, to the expression Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, of course they bloody matter, you know, they just do. But their, their political ideology and backbone is very much revolutionary. You know, they are old fashioned leftist Marxists. They like and believe in revolution. And sometimes an, an uprising is a part of their, of, of their tactic. And when you throw onto that um, very febrile environment, um, a brutal murder, um, which very quickly escalates. Men tribalize at that point because I think they think it's it's what you do. And then the, the counter demonstration, if you like, after the, the statues have been vandalized in the UK, was the same sense of, of uprising and resistance um, in a fight fire with fire way. And a lot of these people, uh, you know, the, from the backgrounds they come, the football lads alliance, so they are. They are um, not very well educated. They're very working class. They understand. They're the same people that my mum taught all those years ago, a lot of them. Now, they come from backgrounds where they're not the most articulate verbally, and they think that you communicate in, in those instances with physicality, mm. and physicality begets physicality. If you go fighting on the streets, people are gonna fight back. And the, I guess the toughest of any tribe will be the ones on the front line and the media is on the front line. 
And so we have a polarization of a situation um, where, if you like, the, the, the best and the worst examples of every movement is shown in direct confrontation. And it's undeniably true that the Black Lives Matter movement has been more mixed gender and more mixed race. And the, the yobbos, let's be frank, not everyone that went to protect those statues was a, a right wing extremist, fascist and all the rest of it. A lot of the people that went down there were former servicemen who, who believed in protecting the flag and queen and country. Unfashionable values in, 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 in certain circles in modern times. Mm. But nevertheless, core values to them. But they did it by marching with the flag in the, with their medals and their uniforms in a way that was much more respectful. But again, it didn't get the media attention. The media, in a sense, by the time this happened, because of the bogeyman that put in the strings behind, you know, on the football side, um, you know his name, because of the people involved, they wanted this to happen because it was pro it's proof that Britain was endemically racist. Mm. So, um, coupled to that, there was a much more standoffish police presence at the Black Lives Matter demo the week before. Um, the there were policemen in short sleeves and without the right equipment. Uh, there was a lot of police unrest about that because they weren't happy about being sent into a, an environment where it kicked off very quickly. So they were sort of unable to respond without putting themselves in danger. And so the statues were desecrated. What happened at the weekend was inevitable. You know, I've been saying it all week. Here we go. And for me, for somebody who who's, comes from a traditionally very working class left wing background, who got into politics um, to ensure democracy was enacted, it was it was deeply upsetting to see um, that um, Britain's right wing extremists in many senses have been driven from the table you know, by making politics more centrist. UKIP had, had had more or less vanished, never mind you know, the EDL and all of those groups. And through, I think, a combination of weak policing, um, media whipping into a frenzy, the media absolutely, have, I think, have got something to, 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 to do in this. Um, we then had a situation where we had running riots in the streets and punch-ups, and, and, and it was quite sad to see. But I, I think, you know, how do we move forward in this environment without listening? Because at the moment, you know, we have deep entrenchment on both sides. We have deep entrenchment politically. You know, the Labour Party is, is, is very much behind one side the Tories aren't really at the table at the moment they, they just they, they seem to be largely absent the police are terrified of, of going one way or the other and so it's the perfect storm you know for masculine tropes to be put on top of it and for it to kick off sadly yeah, yeah I um I, I saw absolutely beautiful um scene with uh his name's patrick hutchinson i know yeah. you tweeted about him and i just really feel like thank god that actually some of the mainstream media caught fire of it and and published it rightfully because i th i feel that depicts britain today 90 90 percent of the time yeah. um but sadly the more airtime got covered of the two weekends mm. was just mm. male tribalistic extreme behavior um mm. you know i think that patrick hutchinson is just mm. You know, I, I would say he's a legend, and he is. But I think most mm. most people would have done what he did. Um, yeah. So I just think we've got to be really careful with how we interpret media today, um, yeah. and how that affects all people and their mm. mental health. And I feel like it has. I feel you know the lockdowns had an effect on people's mental health. Mm. And that's why I started in line the shadows because I saw, I pre-saw the effects, um, the social effects it's going to have um the statistics that are out there clearly in in the united states and the uk that particularly men and their mental health declined severely as a result of the last financial crash you know self-harm yeah. went up we, you know we're not talking about it to, to highlight so people go oh it's an option we're talking about it so people say look we're here talk mm -hmm. contact us well, um, undeniably that that that's the case i mean when we go back to the work that we did on some of the UCL reports. If you look at what was giving men the most positive mental index, which is a definition um, of how we gauged 
happiness and contentment, it was work, relationships, active social lives, all of the things that the lockdown has has oppressed, spending time with family. Uh, there have been lots and lots of incidents of men who've been prevented from seeing their children if they're separated from the mother because of the lockdown being, in a sense, utilized or even in some cases weaponized as a way of control. So when you, when you throw in job loss, when you throw in social isolation, men aren't good at social isolation. They, they, tend, they tend to become quite introverted and then you start to consider your entire validity as a man. If you're, if you're not providing, if you're not in a relationship, then men are more likely to turn to alcohol, to substances, and, and then we have the spiral. And we've been saying since the very beginning that we should have a more gendered approach to this. In Australia, um, a good friend of mine, Glenn Poole, he works at the Men's Health Foundation. They're a governmental organization um, where they, they actually look at things like male suicide and, and, and say, yeah, we have a gendered problem here. Two thirds of suicides are men. So what is it about men that's different and how could we talk and listen differently? And they're able to do that. But we don't have anybody in government here that does anything akin to that in the UK. As I mentioned earlier, we have, a, we have an equalities committee that won't even use the word men when it looks at the numbers of, of the victims. The men most at danger are those on the front lines doing low paid jobs with high public interface, taxi drivers, bus drivers, security guards. Who speaks for those guys politically? But the truth is, a lot of these people are politically homeless. Mm. Um, the media doesn't really care about them. They would rather rump, lump them all into a group of what Brexiteers, extremists, whatever. Yeah. You know that they, they they tend to be the bogeymen of the time. And unfortunately, until we sort of push back against that, then we're going to be in this situation. But the problem has always been that there's a very very highly mobilised and well funded. Um, groups of organizations, charitable groups and political groups that want to make sure things like domestic violence are always on the front page. And of course, that's very, very important. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, my, my, my concern all, all along has been, why can't we care about equality for everybody? Isn't that the def definition of equality? You know, let's care about everybody. So I, I really care about ending domestic violence. It's an issue that affected my family and my sister became the victim of domestic violence. It really, really, and so did my mother later on when she, when she remarried. Very traumatic, you know, moments for, at the time I was a teenage boy, teenage man. It's like, what would I have done at that time? I contemplated doing something terrible. Yeah. You know, not to myself, but to them. But I wouldn't be a happy father of two if I'd have done that. I'd have been one of those blokes in the prison that I went and spoke to. Mm. And as a gateway, at those moments in life and not everybody you know has the, the the moral fortitude or the background or the restraint or whatever it is to, to decide not to do it yeah and that and that one moment can be life-changing and then the compassion for that demographic that's demonized absolutely everywhere in the media has gone mm -hmm. and until we can put that to one side can we genuinely address the needs of everybody? Like I've been campaigning on, on, on white working class lads and education for years. And it was always on a TV debate on BBC or ITV or Sky News. Within five seconds, it was, yeah, what about the black boys? I said, no, I care about them as well. Yeah. But the data shows that the white boys are the furthest behind. And actually, we can learn a load of lessons from the Indian families because look at their work ethic. Well, look, look at the look Chinese where the families. fathers are. The fathers are there. Yeah. In the African British yeah. communities, white working class, they're not. And what does that create? Poverty. So yeah, well, and and also, it's it's a it's a point it's a purpose void. It's a void of purpose. And if you haven't got a purpose, uh, if there isn't a point to your life, or if the end point is benefits dependency, or when I look around, the people in my neighbourhood, well, that guy's dealing some heroin. You know, he's doing all right. He's got a nice pair of trainers. He's got a nice car. But maybe I'll try a bit of that. Education's not for me. You know, my parents told me that. My teachers tell me that. My schoolmates tell me that. 
You know, if, if boys try too hard at school, they can be, they can be dangerous in certain schools to be too smart, to be the SWAT. You know, you, so, and so there's all of these complex things that are holding these people back. And yet, if you go into government and say, well, what about the white boys? They go, well, really, well, what about, you know, and then they go back to white privilege and, you know, the men who run the world are all white men. It's like, yeah, but the, the boys from the council estate in Eastwood I've got as much chance of running the country as I've got of becoming an astronaut. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And one of the one of the true problems of of identity politics is how it's pitched everybody against anybody else in that demographic. And it's like not all what black people are the same, not all white people are the same, not all men are the same, not all women are the same. When can we just be compassionate and evidence based and show that it's humanity? Come on, fire! Love yeah. it. That's what I think. Yeah, I, it's, um, I think we're on the right track, brother. And I believe, you know, all the work that you're doing and the Boys Men Coalition in Light in the Shadows, um, just long may it continue. And we really hope and pray we just keep the consistency there, keep putting our stake in the ground, keep um, being empathetic, keep listening, keep being representational to these people. And um, we'll get there till our grave we'll get there so yeah um i want to only ask you the last question i asked this mine it's been absolutely class today um i love your intellect i love your insights and your experience you're so um articulate and that's why you're a journalist and um yeah may this get out far and wide but um in light in the shadows is it's for men and it's for their mental health and just being mindful of the now and let's be mindful that right now there's probably folks watching this who feel just utterly helpless so my Light in the Shadows question to you, Martin, is can you give one piece of advice for a man right now who just feels utterly helpless? It's a hard question to answer because, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm going through my own soul searching at the moment too. I've I had a big transition in my life with um, getting into politics and it's, it's something that I worried about a lot. Um, would it affect um, my ability to work down the line because it's such a polarised area? And the one thing that I've, and I've gone into historically periods of great self-reflection where, you know, you can get morose. And the one thing that's always helped me out um, is just to have a plan. You know, when I say a plan, it's, it's, it's generally because you know, I've tried my whole life to sort of, if you like, to re-educate my DNA about, you know, being a working class bloke. But actually, the thing that makes me happy is work. It just does. And I've been in dialogue with um, one of my MEP colleagues, Michael Heaver, and we're going to start a new media channel. Um, we're, we're starting that this week. Um, I think there's a huge appetite. So here, here's the point. I've been sat around for weeks getting depressed about the media. You know, something that I've been involved in for 25 years, I think is dying before my eyes. You know, nobody speaks to me or people like me in the media. In fact, worse, I'm, I'm, I'm make, made to feel terrible about myself um, by the media, uh, for who I am, what my beliefs are, through not having done anything myself. It's just my very existence is a problem for the media. So there are two things I can do. I can go on Facebook all day and slag about that and get more angry and more depressed, although I, I will find validation in peer groups, because like, we all like an echo chamber. Yeah. And we all like to go, yeah, well, I'm really angry too. But then where does that get you? Or you can do something about it and, and just start like a new podcast, start a new YouTube channel. And I think you're dead right with Enlighten the Shadows. It's all of us can be citizen journalists now. And it's in a sense, technology has become something that's, that's enslaved us. That's the negative side. Oh, you're always on your phone. Oh, no, you, you can't switch off. But it can also empower us if we can become a voice in the wilderness and we can find our own communities. One of the brilliant things about the internet, and especially for men, by the way, is has been our ability to find communication and support networks, sometimes and oftentimes anonymously, yeah. but nevertheless make us feel better about ourselves. Because if we're all stuck at home because of the, the lockdown or whatever, we can find people online and we don't need to be ranting and raving about stuff. We can do something positive about it. So it's scary because I'm effectively saying, 
this thing I've worked for for 25 years, actually, I don't recognize it anymore, mm. which probably means I won't get any more work. But it means I can say, I think actually there's a lot of people out there like me, like you, who, who, who feels this, yeah. this void. Yeah. You know, I, I'm fed up of being told that I'm terrible for, for merely existing. So I'm going to do something about it. And just deciding to do something about it has given me a huge uplift. So I guess amidst all of the kind of media that comes into your life and it makes, yeah. you, it makes a load of us angry, you know, what could be something positive to do about it? And for me, I think it's going to be that. For you, it's been a light in the shadow. Yeah. And for many other people, it'll be something different. It might be selling your house or moving out, moving town. I've, I've got friends who've, who've been greatly help through this COVID network by reforming relationships with their parents or their siblings. Because mm. I've had a fractious relationship with my mum, you know, she's, she's my mum. And during this, we've become really close again. You know, I've actually reached out to her and, and I, I think when I'm finally allowed to see her, one of the positive things will be I'll, I'll have a stronger relationship with my, with my parents through not seeing them. And no doubt after 10 minutes we'll start falling out again. But, 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 <laughs> but the point is, so what really matters and what really matters to me is work and family. Yeah. Yeah. So make make a plan. You know, yeah. it's tough times. Work, pursue something, and go for it. And I think also sometimes one of the suicide um, anti-suicide charities that I've done a lot work, a lot of work with the campaign against living miserably. They said very early on, which I thought was really telling, uh, if you're getting stressed by the media, stop watching it. You can just stop watching. You can just turn off Facebook. You can just turn off Twitter. You can just stop watching the tally and yeah. read a book. I read a book yesterday. You know, my, my wife and kids went back to school for the first time in three months yesterday. It's the first day off I've had in three months. I've been homeschooling. I've been, you know, I, I yes. protected and nurtured my children. I was like, right, I can do anything. What am I going to do? I sat down and read a book. Mm. It was peaceful. It was calm. And I haven't done it in many, many months. Sometimes switch off the outside world and, and work on what you can control yourself. Amazing. That's great, mate. Lovely advice. Yeah, yeah um, I've really enjoyed today. Thank you so much. Um, to, the, to the viewers, um, thank you for tuning in. If you like this video, um, it's coming up on the screen right now on that red bar. Click that subscribe, click the blue form, like it, get on your Facebook, get on your Twitter share the granny out of it it's almost like my motto now and um, we also have our platforms on instagram and twitter um it coming up right now at enlighten the sh1 and we just want to create more of a following we're not begging it but we almost are because the more this information gets out and reaches more men you know the better it's not about me it's not about enlighten the shadows we are just one of many great groups there's men's unite there's andy's man club there's all these others popping off and the more we can get out is the more uh, reach it's got. So we just want to say thank you so much to all the viewers who've been watching every episode and all to the new ones. Welcome. And just, I hope that you continue to join this journey with us. Um, thank you so much, guys. I just want to say, Martin, you're, you're the man. I'm loving the insights, pure fire. Um, I can't <laughs> wait to um, just collab with you in the future i know that we met for a reason and i'm looking forward to the future in whatever way that looks like so yeah thanks mate and more than that it'd be great to have a pint again soon mate come on <laughs> <laughs> all right viewers thank you god bless um bye-bye <laughs>